Welcome back. We will be continuing our focus on techniques used in the laboratory to study DNA and RNA. The last two lectures on Chapter 5 will focus on Sections 5.2 through 5.5. This lecture will focus on bioinformatics and the first part of Section 5.3 on cloning and recombinant protein expression. So in this lecture, we are continuing our exploration of DNA laboratory techniques with the focus on basics in bioinformatics and DNA cloning techniques. With the advent of cheaper next generation sequencing technologies that we explored in a previous section, there has been a huge amount of sequencing data from all kinds of different organisms that has flooded our databases. Thus, we have needed the development of computer tools and resources to help us analyze the data and make predictions based on comparisons with sequences that have known functions. Bioinformatics usually involves the following steps. Collecting statistics from biological data, building a computational model, solving a computational modeling problem, and testing and evaluating a computational algorithm. The field of bioinformatics is focused on answering questions about the types of biological information and databases that are out there, the sequence analysis and molecular modeling of proteins and enzymes, genomic analysis, and systems biology. A lot of resources and tools have been developed for analyzing genome sequences. Genomic tools have been developed to analyze genome sequences for potential or predicted open reading frames and often rely on homology with known sequences for identification. This has given rise to comparative genomics where complete genomes of similar organisms are compared. This can be especially useful in identifying virulence factors in bacteria and viruses especially when one related strain shows high toxicity while another one does not. And proteomics is specialized to study the protein expression patterns within different locations in a single organism or between different but related organisms. There are many aspects of genome analysis. These include areas such as drug discovery and personalized medicine especially in the areas of cancer research and diagnostics, forensic science and ancestry identification, biodefense, and the development of new fields such as nutrigenomics. Genome analysis can provide the starting place for many interesting lines of research. In the next section, we will investigate gene cloning and protein expression techniques. So let's get started learning about techniques used to clone genes and express proteins. As we saw with protein analysis, gel electrophoresis is an important way of visualizing, isolating, and purifying DNA. Typically, agarose gels are used to analyze DNA fragments. As with protein gels, the DNA is run through an electric current towards the positive lead. DNA is quite negatively charged due to the phosphate groups. And in gel electrophoresis, it's separated based on its size. These smaller fragments can pass through the gel more quickly and move farther away from the wells than our larger fragments. This is especially useful for visualizing PCR products and DNA plasmids for gene cloning. Once a gene of interest has been identified, RT-PCR is used to amplify a copy of cDNA. Recall that this type of DNA will not contain any intron sequences, making gene expression easier. Regular PCR can be used for prokaryotic genes as they normally do not contain intron sequences. Once the gene has been amplified, it needs to be cloned into an expression vector, such as the one shown here. This will allow the gene to be replicated within a host species and also allows a host species to express the gene of interest and produce the desired protein. Cloning vectors typically contain specific features that allow them to replicate and be selected for within the host. This includes an origin of replication, which allows the vector to be recognized by the host DNA replication machinery 
and replicated within the cell. Without an ORI, the vector would be lost from the host following replication. In addition to the origin of replication, cloning vectors usually contain a selectable marker that allows host cells that contain the vector to be isolated away from cells that do not contain the vector. In bacterial systems, antibiotic resistance genes are usually used for this purpose. Once your gene of interest has been cloned into the vector and the vector is transformed into the host, the host can be grown on the antibiotic of choice. Only host cells containing the vector and expressing the antibiotic resistance gene will then survive. Those colonies can then be used to either express the protein or be a reservoir for collecting and re-isolating copies of the cloning vector. Cloning vectors will also contain a polylinker region or a multiple cloning site that contains sequences of DNA that are recognized by restriction enzymes. These restriction sites are noted in blue for this vector. This type of restriction enzyme system is highly useful for the cloning procedure and we will take a look at this in greater detail. The restriction enzymes most widely used in cloning recognize specific sequences within the DNA called palindromes. The one pictured above is called BAMH1 and its palindrome is read in the 5' prime direction GGATCC. You can see that when you read either the forward or the reverse strand in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction that the sequence is the same, always GGATCC. This is what's meant by a palindrome. Some restriction enzymes such as BAMH1 do not cut the restriction site in the middle. Instead, the cut site is offset on either strand, creating a single-stranded overhang on each strand. In the case of BAMH1, it cuts the palindrome sequence after the G's. These overhanging sites are known as sticky ends and provide an important resource for aiding in the cloning process. Restriction enzymes and their sequences are named from the organisms from which they were derived. BAMH1 is from Bacillus amyloliquefaciens strain H and was the first restriction enzyme isolated from this strain, hence the name BAMH1. Restriction enzyme systems can be so useful for cloning because PCR primers can be engineered to contain the correct restriction sites at each end of the sequence so that both the PCR product and the vector can be cut with the restriction enzymes. The enzyme is then removed from each of the DNA fragments by ethanol precipitation and the two fragments can be mixed together. In some cases, the sticky overhangs of the insert will align with the vector, causing the gene of interest to stick with the vector. An enzyme called DNA ligase can then be added to the mixture to seal the backbone and form a covalent bond of the sugar phosphate backbone, effectively permanently attaching the insert to the vector at the specific restriction enzyme location. Because the cloning occurs at a known location within the vector, a very detailed sequence map can be made of the cloning vector that allows its easy recognition during agarose gel electrophoresis. If you want to express your gene of interest and then isolate or study the protein encoded by it, then the vector needs to contain some expressional elements as well. It will need a promoter in the DNA sequence that will be recognized by the RNA polymerase so that transcription can occur, generating a messenger RNA molecule. The resulting messenger RNA must also have a ribosomal binding site engineered into it so that it can be recognized by the ribosome and translated into the protein sequence. If these are not present within the cloning vector, these sequences can often be engineered into the PCR primer sequence, although many commercial vectors have been made and optimized to have these features. Sometimes you may want to study a promoter region and see what types of enhancers or transcription factors might bind to the region. In this case, you might want to use a reporter gene system to assess the biological activity of the promoter region. In this type of system, the promoter is the region of interest and the area of the vector that will vary. 
the downstream gene will typically encode for a protein that is easy to assay or visualize, such as the green fluorescent protein, or an enzyme such as LAXE that can cleave a dye molecule, providing a color metric method of detection. So here is a nice summary chart of a DNA cloning experiment. Overall, you will have a template DNA. This is your genomic DNA from your system that you'll be studying that contains your gene of interest. The gene of interest will then be PCR amplified. The vector that you want to use to clone your gene into and the PCR product will both be cleaved by the restriction enzymes to create these sticky end overhangs. The restriction enzyme is removed from the system and the vector and the PCR product are brought together in the same tube. DNA ligase is also added such that the sticky ends can align between the insert and the vector and the DNA ligase will seal the backbone. The completed vector is then transformed into bacterial host species. Plasmids are extra chromosomal material that exist outside of the normal chromosome of the bacteria and they can replicate independently. Notice that in this diagram you have some different situations once you mediate your transformation. Some of the bacteria will not be transformed at all. Some of the bacteria will only be transformed with the vector that is resealed during the ligation process but has not accepted the PCR insert. Other plasmids will have your PCR insert included within the vector. These are the ones that you want to isolate and then grow as a colony or a single individual clone that will produce your gene of interest. So to help with this selection process, many of the vectors have what's called a blue-white selection process. So this LAC-Z gene that we mentioned in the reporter section can cleave a dye product and make a blue color when it's present. In this situation, the bacterial chromosome is missing that LAC-Z gene, and the LAC-Z gene is present in the vector, but it's only present in the vector that does not contain any of your insert. Your insert is going to be placed in the middle of the LAC-Z gene, so it disrupts the LAC-Z gene completely, and then only your protein of interest can be expressed from this region of the vector. So when you look at your colonies and they're grown on that dye matrix, the blue colonies are going to represent colonies that have taken up the vector that does not contain any insert. So you would not want to select any of the blue colonies. Instead, you would want to select the white colonies. They have disrupted the LAXE gene and the vector then likely contains the insert. Notice that none of the bacteria that have not taken up the vector are growing as colonies on our plate. This is because we also have the antibiotic that is included in the growth matrix. The antibiotic recall is the selectable marker that's in a different region on this plasmid. And so the only colonies that can grow out are the colonies that contain the vector, either the vector without the insert or the vector with the insert. But bacteria that have not taken up any vector will be killed in this process and not able to grow. So now we want to talk just a little bit more about the types of vectors that can be used for cloning experiments. These include the plasmids that we've been discussing so far, bacteriophages, cosmids, and artificial chromosomes from bacteria, yeasts, and humans. As we noted in the previous slide, a plasmid is a small extrachromosomal DNA molecule within a cell that is physically separated from the chromosomal DNA, and it can replicate independently. They are most commonly found as small, circular, double-stranded DNA molecules in bacteria. However, plasmids are sometimes present in archaea and eukaryotic organisms. In nature, plasmids often carry genes that benefit the survival of the organisms and confer a selective advantage, such as antibiotic resistance. While chromosomes are large and contain all of the essential genetic information for living under normal conditions, plasmids are usually very small and contain only additional genes that might be useful in certain situations or conditions. We have artificially done extensive development of plasmids to serve as vectors in biochemistry and molecular biology. 
They are probably one of the most widely used tools within the lab. They're usually suitable for carrying 1 kb to 5 kb of DNA inserts. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria and archaea. They are among the most common and diverse entities in the biosphere. Bacteriophages are ubiquitous viruses found everywhere bacteria exist. It is estimated that more than 10 to the 31 bacteriophages are on the planet more than every other organism on Earth. They can carry quite a bit more DNA than a standard plasmid. For the lambda phage, shown here, an upper limit of about 53 kb of DNA can be reached. They also have a lower minimal requirement of DNA length as well and are not suitable for small insert sizes. Interestingly, viruses are also proving to be useful vectors for delivering genetic information into humans as well. Currently, Adenoviruses are being used to deliver vaccines for more virulent viral infections such as Ebola and, and they are useful in some gene therapy strategies. Cosmids are plasmids that incorporate a segment of bacteriophage lambda DNA that has cohesive end sites or cost sites which contain elements required for packaging DNA into the lambda particles. It is normally used to clone large DNA fragments between 28 and 45 kb. Once the phage particles have infected a host, the DNA recircularizes and forms a replicating plasmid within the bacteria. Artificial chromosome structures have also been developed in many host species and can hold large DNA fragments up to 120 kb or more in some cases. Reproductive cloning is another method that's used to make a clone or an identical copy of an entire multicellular organism. Most multicellular organisms undergo reproduction by sexual means, which involves the contribution of DNA from two individual parents, making it impossible to generate an identical copy or a clone of either parent. However, recent advances in biotechnology have made it possible to reproductively clone mammals in the laboratory. Dolly the sheep was the first agricultural animal to be cloned. To create Dolly, the nucleus was removed from a donor egg cell from the Scottish blackface sheep. The enucleated cell and the other cell from the donor were placed next to each other and they were shocked to fuse them together into a single cell. So now this egg cell contains the cytoplasm from the Scottish blackface and a mixture of cytoplasm and the nucleus from the mammary cell of the Finn Dorset donor. The egg cell was then shocked again to help start cell division and the generation of a blastocyst. The blastocyst was then implanted into a surrogate sheep and was allowed to develop, creating Dolly, who is genetically identical to her mother. In the next section, we'll visit a new method called CRISPR-Cas that's being used to make real-time genetic alterations in living organisms.